Okay, there are still a lot of people joining, so I think we'll give it just one more minute before we start. Uh, but really nice to see so many here already. And yeah, let's just wait a few, one or two minutes uh, to let everyone join the meeting. Okay, then I think we should start. Uh, so welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, it's hosted by the Swedish Space Data Lab, which is a collaboration between AI Sweden, RISE and Luleå uh, Technical University. Uh, and my name is Johanna Bergman and I'm head of project portfolio at AI Sweden. Uh, and we'll be guiding you through this, uh, tr through this webinar and try to keep track of all questions and the time and everything. Um, so I will show you the agenda for today. Uh, we have this short introduction uh, and then we will move on to uh, Adam Lewis that will give us an international outlook from Digital Earth Africa and Digital Earth Australia. Uh, also talking about the Open Data Cube initiative uh, and then we will move on to uh, to Europe and uh, the European Space, Space Agency and Fee Labs um, and listening listen to what they are doing about what advanced um, AI solutions and things like that in collaborate uh, in um, for satellite images for example then we will have a short break uh, and then zoom into Sweden and the Swedish Space Data Lab uh, where Tobias from the Swedish National Space Agency will uh, guide us through and also Jörgi from Luleå Technical University will talk a bit about the AI applications for the Swedish Space Data Lab. So I think we have a really exciting time ahead of us and I will stop share my screen and also introduce our first uh, speaker. Uh, so just a minute here. Um, so we'll start by this international outlook from, from Adam. And you are, um, I will see here, thank you for Sweden. Welcome to Sweden, first of all, at least virtually. <laughs> and thank you for uh, sharing your experiences with us. You are the managing director of Digital Earth Africa and you also led the development of the Australian Geoscience Data Cube, uh, which is now Digital Earth Australia, right? Yeah, that's, uh, yes, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. <laughs> uh, and that was also the start of the Open Data Cube initiative, right? Correct, yes. Yeah, okay, really nice. Okay, then I think you can, uh, yeah, I will also say for all um, attendees, and um, you can ask all questions you have in the chat or in the Q&A box, and I will treat, keep, try to keep track on everything and also uh, ask Adam questions after the presentation. So there will be a lot of time uh, for questions as well. So please ask your questions in the chat and the Q&A uh, box. Okay, Adam, I think you can share your screen and, uh, and start your presentation. Okay, let's see how that goes. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Johanna? Yes, it's perfect. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for that kind introduction and um, 
Good morning, good evening, and good day, everybody. These things are generally global. Uh, yeah, my name is Adam Lewis. I'm, I'm leader of the, or managing director of the establishment team for Digital Earth Africa, which will become a little bit um, uh, clearer later why I emphasize that word establishment. Um, before I go on, I would like to uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. And uh, it's lovely to have an opportunity to speak to others about their building of data cubes. I'd, I'd acknowledge the contributions from the entire Digital Earth Africa team. Um, so nothing that I'm showing here is, is really my own work. It's inevitably somebody else's that we put together as a team. Uh, and I will try to stay, stay relatively brief with plenty of time for questions. Um, and with that, let me move on. I am going to speak mainly about Digital Earth Africa, um, but I'm happy to take questions on, on Digital Earth Australia or the Open Data Cube, and I'll do my best to answer those. Uh, there are some touch points at the end around that, and uh, I'm happy to yeah, take that as we go. The uh, Digital Earth Africa itself, I put this up here, it's about people as much as technology, and this is our, our website, um, which has recently been refreshed, and, and the faces are just some of the people we've had in, who are in part of the program, whether they're based in Africa or, or the US or Australia. Many of the technical people at the moment are still based in Australia with a series of implementing partners uh, in Africa. I'm going to do a bit about the background and the sort of um, governance of the program, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the products we're developing. And that bit gets a bit technical. I've sort of assumed a technical audience that would be interested in AI and machine learning. So forgive me if I go a bit deep there. Um, and then at the end, I've just got some a couple of general reflections. The starting with the program, the, the vision for DE Africa uh, focuses on benefits. How can we really enable improved decisions and progress towards key agendas? Uh, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So the vision is that we're providing a routine and reliable and operational service using Earth observations to deliver decision ready products, enabling policymakers, scientists, the private sector and civil society to address social and environmental and economic changes on the continent. So you can read into that some of the um, principles we have as well. And, and our mission is, if you like, how we'll work to create value. Uh, and that captures a few things also. It, it highlights the Afri Geo community, which is the, the African uh, arm of Geo, the Group on Earth Observations. Uh, and it talks about us being um, uh, open, having open data and accessible products, um, producing information that use, that's useful for decisions, um, being responsive to the African community, to the needs and, cha and challenges and priorities, and also being agile and adapting. So that's, and they can be found on our website, but they, they're a key document for us. Um, the, the principles are our guiding light. The principles on the right here are a sense of a guiding light. These are a high level summary of a number of principles that our, our advisory committee developed. Uh, this is the African based advisory committee that I'll come to in a moment, that set us on the right course. And they include a commitment to free, free and open data, to principles like interoperability, uh, whilst respecting privacy and integrity. The idea of an operational service, that is a very distinguishing statement. This is not about um, research or localized product or things we might figure out how to do and, uh, and do once. The idea is that we can produce, we have enough science and methods in the world now to produce operational and consistent continental scale products um, that we can sustain um, and that build on domain and empower domain expertise. The accountable and transparency side is about the program being adaptable and responsive to African priorities. Uh, and very importantly, there's some very strong words in our statement of principles about diversity and inclusion and, and gender diversity as well. Um, but diversity here is about uh, diversity of people. And we in fact have a gender equity, diversity, inclusiveness strategy, uh, but also diversity across sectors not just in one remote sensing sector uh, and certainly spanning the private sector, the education sector, the not-for-profit sector, as well as government. 
these are really core things for the program. Another platform that we're building on that's increasingly important is this idea of partnerships. Uh, and we rationalised why we want partnerships and came up with these three headings that we need to have partners just to deliver. Um, if we're with partners, we can deliver better so we can amplify what we're doing. And we won't be able to sustain the program unless we have partners. And so we have a series of, of really key partners. I haven't listed by any means all of them or even all the important ones here, but the African Regional Institutes, we are out enabling uh, implementing partners. So there are institutes in uh, right across Africa from Tunisia through to South Africa who are in Africa have capabilities and are, are about the implementation. There are programs in Africa already, NASA Severe is particularly important to us, as well as GMES. Uh, and then there are international organizations like GEO and CEOS uh, and AfriGEO that, that provide us with an international context. In the private sector, Amazon Web Services is a crucial partner for us, and that'll come, we'll come to that later. And then in the education sector, the University of Twente is doing our capacity development strategy. So these are the things that we're, we're building on before we get to the technology or after. Um, the people calling the shots uh, are in the picture here that this is, uh, whilst I lead the establishment team, the governance framework sets the directions and ultimately I have to hold myself accountable both to our funders and my Australian government bosses, um, but also and, and almost more importantly to the governance that's establishing and guiding the program. Um, the technical advisory committee is a crucial committee uh, and we are currently establishing the, the forming the board, um, but that technical advisory committee has 18 members drawn from countries across the continent. And they bring uh, perspectives, not just from government, but also from the private sector, from the innovation sector, and from the education sector. Have a, and they ultimately endorse the directions and decisions that we're making. The, the program, you can think of the pro where we're at in this program as having three phases. There was a phase one, which established the feasibility of it. And that was funded in 2018 and, and put forward the argument for other funders to fund the implement the establishment. The first phase was funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. So I'd like to acknowledge them. Since 2019, uh, uh, two years ago, almost, uh, we've been funded for the establishment phase. And our key funders there are the Leona M and Harry B Helmsley Charitable Trust uh, and the Australian Government Aid Program. They have funded us to establish something. Um, so we're not about a limited time program where we build something and walk away. And our job, my job, is to establish something that will be ongoing. And so phase three is sustainment. And we don't know where the funding for that is coming from yet. I've noted the establishment was, is 2019 to 2022. The, uh, I expect that to extend out somewhat um, into 2023. Uh, obviously, this program is about satellite data and, and we've been measuring Earth from satellites for, for 40 years. Australia itself had been capturing data for since 1979, since uh, when I took up the reins there. Uh, my personal driver, perhaps the strongest enduring one for all this work is, that, is a simple question. We've got so much data, why do we make so little use of it? And that question uh, has been a driver for me for the last 15 years. And it's as true now as it, it was then. What it led to, and, and the answer to part of that question was this Australian Geoscience Data Cube, which then became uh, the Open Data Cube. And the ideas inherent in that data cube are that for satellite images, we should work with satellite pixels as individual measurements, that we should calibrate and quantify those measures and the quality assure those measurements and use them en masse. And that if we do that and use them as time series, we can reveal really exciting new information and produce things like this surface water map of Australia, which was the first thing we produced with the data cube um, in 2013. In fact, the need to produce that was the reason we finally created the data cube, the original data cube. Um, this graphic indicates the overall idea um, that the way to support decision-making most effectively 
um, which is the people on the right, uh, using satellites, the stuff on the left, is through, um, is that uh, to support that as a general process that maximizes the use of the data for as many people as possible is through a series of steps. Um, the idea that the data will be quantitative and, and analysis ready data, where each observation is a measurement and you quality assure it. So each pixel has a flag saying whether or not it's cloudy or whether or not it's trustworthy. Um, that can then be used to produce quanti continental scale products using infrastructures like the data cube. And those products can help to inform a, a wide range of decisions across multiple sectors and across multiple themes. So that's the sort of broad architectural idea behind the data cube uh, and Digital Earth Australia and now Digital Earth Africa. Um, I should mention that there is also a, a, a distinct program logic and investment design behind the program. Uh, which is something our funders required and that's helped us to articulate from outcome from high level outcomes back to what it is we're doing on a day to day basis. And those um, high level outcomes are around having a, an operational and sustainable infrastructure in, in Africa that has impact for people and that it's part of an international community. I'm not going to go into that in any further detail. When we talk about the actual program itself, it's easier to think about it as three separate steps. And I'll just go through those now. So the first step, which was we had initially said was year one, and it roughly was year one, was essentially setting the foundations, designing the governance and institutionalizing it, um, building the technical platform and services, uh, and starting to get into the capacity and update, uptake in Africa. And that ran, that, that was largely covered in the first year with a few carryovers. Um, because allowing for COVID and life and technical hang-ups uh, and dependencies on third parties, things tend to stretch a little bit. The second step, which was sort of the year just gone by, but we're not, not yet through it entirely, is actually trying to uh, starting to build capacity and uptake, um, further institutionalize the governance, but having transitions from previous systems like the Africa Regional Data Cube to Digital Earth Africa, um, operationalizing the technical platform, beginning the capacity and update process, regular training capacity building programs uh, and stakeholder engagement uh, became uh, the, the, the focus for that year. Again, this is, and this is now drifting a little bit, so we're not quite on target. And then the third step and the crucial one for sustainment is, is we need to get to the point where we have a growing ecosystem of use of the infrastructure we're building. And I think the model I have in my head here is that we may target specific users, we may develop products and take them to one particular user, but those products being free and open and the services around them should enable another nine users to be leveraging the data and information in ways that we haven't anticipated. And that's the way to achieve growth. And if you think about how satellite data underperforms, uh, the use and uptake of satellite data is certainly growing, but it's not growing exponentially the way that digital platforms and compute are growing. It's still catching up. So we've got, we should be setting ambitious targets for that. Uh, moving on from there, I want to talk a little bit about some of our recent progress. Uh, most excitingly is, is that we've signing partnership agreements with our enabling partners in Africa. And I, I haven't listed them all here and the, the list there is, um, is incomplete, uh, so you should ignore it. But the institutions we're working with start in the north with the OSS, the Office for the Sahara and the Sahel in Tunisia, um, with, with uh, CSE in Senegal, uh, there's an AFRIGIST in Niger and uh, Agrimet in, sorry, Agrimet in Niger and AFRIGIST in Nigeria. We have a key partners in Ghana, um, the, the Center for Resources for Mapping for Resource Development in uh, Kenya, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, um, and moving down to the South African National Space Agency, uh, SANSA, and then we have members of our technical advisory committee from other countries roughly indicated on that map. So we have, we have identified 
um, a number of these organizations as implementing partners and we're starting to transition the work to those implementing partners. Amazon Web Services is, is listed on there because the, the Amazon uh, facility in Cape Town is where we're now storing data. That partnership is particularly important and exciting. So early, later in 2020, uh, we moved our data to the Cape Town facility. Uh, that's part of the um, Amazon Sustainability Initiative. And we have something like two petabytes of data there. I think we have 1.6. I think Amazon will ask us what, ask us to, um, to make a note of it when we get to two petabytes. Uh, we think this is the largest continental data store of Earth observation that exists so far. Doubtless that will, will change rapidly over time as these things do. Um, but Amazon are a crucial technical enabling partner. And once data are in Amazon, it becomes important, not just for us, this is, this is open data, so anybody can access it. Whilst we can access it and rely on it as an operational platform to analyze data on, third parties can also access the data and rely on that as a back end. So it becomes a very empowering, it's a very empowering partnership for us. Um, and seemingly Amazon are happy with it also, and I think we'll stay happy. Um, in terms of the, we've, we've developed and delivered some interfaces for Digital Earth Africa, um, two of which we control and one of which we don't. So the, we have a map viewer um, that's at maps.digitalearth.africa. They're all accessible through our website. That's essentially for any general user and allows people to scan around and start to access and explore the data. Uh, there's still training needed to be fluent with that platform, but it does enable just a visual interaction with the rich Earth observation data sets that are building in the platform. The middle one, the sandbox for developers and innovators is becoming increasingly um, used. Uh, and I've got a graph later about that. That's where people can go and it is now openly available. So anybody can sign into the sandbox and start to do analysis and explore analysis and access the online training around the sandbox. And the one on the right is really exciting because it's not one that we control. So this is Esri have put up uh, as part of their public good contribution, access to the Africa Geo portal. There's a mapping interface, which draws on our data and products uh, and allows you to interact with them in an ESRI environment. To me, that's really important because it's one less barrier to access. And the fewer barriers we, to access we have, the more people are going to use the data. I mentioned that we have online training now available. Uh, and so we're pretty excited about that. This is a six week train, self-paced training course. Um, we've personally put 42 people through it um, in Africa. Um, from a very low user base. So we're pretty excited about that. And they are starting to develop with that sandbox new applications for the data and products. We have a series of uh, YouTube how-to webinars around this, introduction to the sandbox, introduction to the Digital Earth African map, working with notebooks. Um, and we've also been participating in webinars like this one. Um, the one at the bottom here is the Amazon Public, De Public uh, Sector Summit Online. So a lot of that um, enabling work has been done and we're starting to see the fruits of that. The benefits of that are coming through things like this graph here. So we started in early 2020 uh, building the sandbox to transition people off the Africa regional data cube, which was a, a prototype infrastructure and into something that, that would be more sustainable. In fact, we, we had only a handful of users of the Africa Regional Data Cube. We've trained those users. And then as we move through to the middle of the year, we made the platform open. Uh, and now we've got somewhere in excess of 300 registered users of the sandbox. That bodes well for the future. We're pretty excited about it. It starts to speak to the fact that people are going to extract value from the data in, in ways that we hadn't foreseen. And we've also this week, in fact, published a report on what that, the value of that could eventually be to people. Uh, in fact, I say we, in fact, the World Economic Forum published uh, this report last Friday, uh, which is about unlocking the potential of Earth observation 
to address Africa's critical challenges. And it does what um, economists do, which is put some big numbers on the potential benefits of Earth observation for Africa. Uh, and the importance of that is to, to draw uh, into, in people's minds how important, how impactful this can be if we do it right. And platforms like Digital Earth Africa are what are needed to, um, to realize that potential. Uh, the lead author on that is uh, an academic and strategist and economist called Nicolo Andruella, um, and that is available online. And at the bottom there is some of the figures that they, in excess of $2 billion, is what the, you know, the potential benefits of Earth observation are in, in Africa. We've also made some really good progress in our capacity development program. We've sort of started designing the program, but as we do, we've um, we've started to move, do things as we're designing. So all the training material that I spoke of earlier almost went in advance of our formalizing the capacity development program, but will now become part of it. Uh, and this year, this work led by ITC and the University of Twente in the Netherlands will, will really take shape. Um, and we'll be training up our uh, implementing partners and, uh, and training them to be trainers of third parties. Um, Going more to the technical side, we've had some massive achievements and we're really pleased with our work in data flows. Um, that's my term. So analysis ready data, having data flowing from uh, the satellite observing platforms is really a fundamental enabler for us because what we want to build is an infrastructure, something that's sustainable and operational. So we've worked very actively with data providers and the private sector to establish these pipelines of data. And we're assuring that they are or ensuring that they are analysis ready so that we're not there is no need once the data are in digital earth africa to further process the data just to get them ready for use that pre-processing step is done uh, they're hosted as i mentioned earlier on the aws public data store as part of the sustain the amazon sustainability program uh, and users can go direct to the data so that's this is a big focus for this year and it ends up being a major achievement so to give you an idea um, every uh, what you're looking at there is the daily capture of sentinel 2 data for africa um, and of course moving one of those data sets to africa is a relatively simple thing i believe it's a, a you know a two-line script but when you're trying to suddenly move a couple of million those data chips to Africa and maintain it on an hourly basis or on a daily basis, it suddenly becomes a technical problem in which things can go wrong. Um, and the chain of supply is on the right there. The, the European Space Agency capture the data. They have a, a team in a company called Synergize that process those data to JPEG 2000 format. We then have a team in a company called Element 84 in the USA who convert those to cloud optimized geotiffs and add a metadata format called stack spatiotemporal asset catalog that makes it data cube friendly um, it then has to be transferred from oregon to amazon web services in cape town and synchronized and at that point we index it into the open data cube so that is now an operational flow that gets updated every day the idea of that because central two data is so dense and africa is so large that ends up being 1.6 petabytes of data. What it means is that once we put that into a data cube, we can start to do amazing things with it we couldn't do before. And we just, we have a beta of this, but it's not public, but uh, and we'll come up with a final product soon. This is a, a continental geomedian, which is a statistical summary of every image in 2019, every, of every pixel of every, every image in 2019 in, in Africa. Um, and that can't produces a very stable image, um, a median image, multidimensionally median image, but also measures around that. that that's the central tendency, what's the variance around it? Uh, and those statistics become very important as well. This is a, the scale of this is, is difficult. I, I tend to sit back in, in my leadership role and say to people, have you got that done yet? Um, but in fact, when I look at it and I do my back of envelope conversa calculations, if you count each pixel and each band as a measurement, which it is, then you're talking about in excess of 10 to the 15 measurements being processed just to make that data set, which is pretty exciting. And it's about a thousand times what the numbers were when we 
did the first data cube in Australia. Uh, that's the Sentinel-2 data stream. We're really excited and anticipating now getting Landsat Collection 2. So this is not a platform that's about one data set. It's a platform that's about uh, as many systematic and, and operational analysis ready data sets that we, as we can get that are, that are also useful. Uh, so Landsat Collection 2 is obviously a very exciting development. Um, it's the first data set globally that complies with the CIOS analysis ready data specifications. Uh, it's now produced and we're positioning ourselves to transfer that and in, have it indexed in the data cube early this calendar year. And as whilst that's being, so that's being produced by the USGS completely to ARD analysis ready data standards. We're also working and have prototyped a pipeline for Sentinel-1 radar data. So this is not produced according to any ARD standard by ESA at this stage or the European Commission. Um, but radar data are really important. It complements optical data, particularly in places like Equatorial West Africa where clouds are very prevalent. Um, what we've done is worked with those same companies, Synergize and Element 84, to work out a processing pipeline that will take Sentinel-1 data and it revisits every 12 days, roughly 20 minute resolution. Um, we now have a process where they can produce standardized products for all of Africa with daily updates. So that will conform to CEOS's normalized radar backscatter specification. And we, I think the processing will happen in, in by March, um, but my technical people haven't committed to that yet. Uh, and we're looking at that, not just as something, that's something we want to do, but we're also, hopeful that the programs like the Copernicus program will look at that as a model for a global supply chain of Sentinel data. Because one of the things that's coming out of this, if I go back to the Sentinel-2 situation, we developed something for, for DE Africa, but in practice, the companies involved are now doing that globally. So that's a pretty exciting development. What that then enables us to do is start making continental products and our first continental systematic product was this water observations from space, which I suspect everybody on the call has heard of. Um, it was first pioneered in Australia in 2013 uh, and is now operational in Australia and will soon be operational on our platform as well. Um, but you'll, you're seeing it here for Africa. So that um, the, the um, product itself captures how frequently water is seen over the surface of the land. And that becomes really empowering for anybody who's interested in, in floods or uh, water supplies or water quality. Uh, and we've this will be finally operationalized as soon as we get the Landsat collection too, and then we'll upgrade it to use Sentinel-2 data as well. But we've been doing a lot of work on the validation of this and actually looking at its accuracy and finding that to be very satisfactory through an independent program. Um, that validation work itself is very important because it engages, it's being done by our partners in these organizations at the bottom, uh, African-based partners. So we are engaging them in the product, in the discipline of validation and in the use of tools like the uh, Open uh, Collect Earth Online tool, which is developed by Severe, a partner that I mentioned earlier, to actually validate the data. Um, so we're really happy about the way that's going. Perhaps, perhaps the most challenging thing we've taken on. So our first continental product was, was water and we decided it would be. And then we moved to, we asked our advisory committee what next and they said food security is the critical issue. So we're now working on what we can contribute to food security as a continental product. And we've identified that that should be a map of areas that are cropped and not cropped that will feed into uh, systems like GeoGlam that can be used continentally and also locally. And the work on that is, is progressing um, as quickly as you'd expect. Uh, we've made pretty good progress in the last half year um, in uh, starting in the Eastern African region. I want to talk to you a little bit about the methodology involved though, because for an institute that's involved in the AI, I think this is, this is interesting. This slide shows the, um, the actual uh, overall approach, which is being piloted in this Eastern agricultural region of, uh, of Africa, including which includes Ethiopia. Uh, and it starts on the right with 
the Sentinel-2 12 monthly time series of data, which ends up being something like 60 images, you'd know. Um, that gets split into two seasons. And then several things happen. The data sets are, are, uh, are created, this, this uh, temporal median is formed from those data sets, which gives you the main, the central tendency. But then a bunch of supporting statistics are calculated around it. And all those data sets plus ancillary data sets uh, are, uh, are used to generate sp uh, spectral indices and are fed into a random uh, a machine learning process to generate random forests. The indices are also used to segment the image. Uh, so there's a segmented image which is can be classified later. But the main process happens around this, how do you build and test and rebuild a random forest using training data and polygons um, until you get a product which is sufficiently accurate. This is a process which normally you do once, but we're actually building the, trying to systematize that. So this sort of process can be run for other themes in the Open Data Cube uh, and the disciplines and learnings can be shared. The idea is uh, of the temporal statistics, I find really fascinating. So this is a, these are time series, um, statistics of mean properties of the each spectral band and on the on the left obviously is the actual red green blue image moving through time of some crop cropped areas and the color the six the, the eight um, images on the right are the different values of different statistical measures um, around that mean tendency so the, to the extent that they are different in each image they they say that there, is, there are differences that can be detected through these statistics. And all of those statistics can be used and can be powerful in that decision tree process. So by using the, the time series, we're really extracting or having access to much more information than was ever possible before. Uh, those are just the statistical measures. If you can, you think about measures of phenology, which is just a term meaning how things look, uh, though then there are measures like the normalized difference, vegetation index and so forth, and the way in which those change, which form another set of statistics that can be leveraged into that um, decision tree process. And this is simply trying to show the same thing that for these field, and, and ultimately those phenology statistics are looking at things like when things start to green or when they start to brown. And so you're trying to get at the process behind the growing season. This whole process is being um, put into a, a cycle that we're trying to support with the Open Data Cube sandboxes. Uh, and Chad Burton, the person doing this, is putting a lot of effort into that, where, where you take some data from a, um, some training data, inspect it to make sure it's of sufficient quality, um, build a classifier, do a prediction, test the prediction, and then go back and, and do it all again until the model is sufficiently accurate to be to be producing useful maps. The the way we're doing that is to oh, sorry, I say we the way Chad is doing that is to uh, study this eastern area of Africa and pull out some sub regions for that, run the model in those regions, test it, compare it with uh, the GFAST, which is the global food security support analysis data from NASA, and look at how credible it is, as well as comparing it against high resolution images. Uh, and field data. And um, we're working with Radiant Earth on that, in term, particularly in terms of the in situ data. And some of the things that are coming out at different levels of detail, but also just dealing with the increase in cropped area since 2015 when the GFSAD was, was produced. This is an area of Ethiopia, which has incredibly high resolution, fine cropped areas, you may know. So, uh, in terms of that, the vision for that is that a scalable machine learning um, workflow is being created so that others can do similar things uh, in an easier way on the Digital Earth Africa sandbox. So the team are trying to build a framework which is reusable, doesn't require ODC, specialization in Open Data Cube, um, has the necessary components that it can be rel rel relatively easily picked up and used and applied to different classification problems. Aside from those continental products, we're starting, as I mentioned earlier, to see a number of users of the 
open data cube sandbox. And those users are the most exciting because as I said earlier, they're the 10 users that we don't know about who are starting to innovate. But we do know about some of the things that are happening and some of the emerging use cases. And a couple are illustrated here. The um, uh, managing um, crop phenology to address food security in Kenya, um, cane poaching of all things, um, burned areas on Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, and the the star at the moment is Stella Mutai, who was um, also uh, won the special Africa prize of, for farming by satellite in this uh, last year, last September, uh, who's based in Kenya and who's in the citation here uses digital Earth Africa data, um, which is of course also Copernicus and Central 2 data uh, in that studies of, of um, coffee growing in Kenya. So these are the, the most exciting thing for us is when we start to see these uh, independent use cases evolve and we capture them because they speak to the value and importance of the program. Um, so just toward the end, I've probably been speaking too long. A couple of reflections on Digital Earth Australia. Um, the advances in, there's a really close link between Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa. The technical teams uh, at the core are shared um, and there's different things which we're working on. So advances in Digital Earth Australia do create opportunities for Digital Earth Africa. And those are mostly in terms of leading product development. So refinements to the water observations for space products that are done in Australia have relevance potentially to Africa. We don't take them to Africa unless our technical advisory committee in Africa will say that that's a priority, but the potential is there. They're doing some very interesting work on land cover in Australia and most exciting of all, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, is this Digital Earth Australia Coastlines which, um, product, which is highly transferable to other parts of the world. On the other hand, Digital Earth Africa is leading in certain ways. We are a much larger scale than, than Australia. The analysis ready data global supply chains are something we're pioneering with others in, in CEOS, the Committee on Earth Observing Satellites, that I think put us a leading edge and make programs much more sustainable. Um, Africa is where we've moved to Amazon Web Services. We're completely in the cloud. And that's something which Australia was struggling with. Uh, and the validation methods and processes we've put in place around WAPS and we'll put in place around the crop mask work we're doing are also, I think, leading edge uh, and are more structured and disciplined than they have in Australia. So there's a, a natural synergy between uh, Africa and Australia in, in these programs. But as going back to that DEA coastlines, the sorts of things that are happening that we could take advantage of. Um, this is what Digital Earth Australia coastlines looks like. It's just, a, it's a case study in how much more information there is in satellite data than has traditionally been extracted. Um, here on the top left, there's a map of Australia showing the entire coastline, which has been assessed for whether or not the coastline is retreating or advancing and the dots say whether or not it's retreating or advancing. And if you look at the dots, if you go in there, it will measure the rate of retreat or advance at sub-meter scale. Um, and this is working from, sorry, and, and if we zoom in at the bottom right, you can actually see where the median coastline's been from 1984 to 2000 or 2020, um, with differences being picked up at a sub-meter scale. And that is all being done from two completely open data sets. One is the temporal series of Landsat, uh, which has 30 meter pixels. And the other is global tidal, tidal models, which are sourced from the University of Oregon. Uh, and the process of doing that is, um, illustrates that there's a lot more information than we can't, we tend to extract from, from remote sensing data. And that particular methodology is highly transportable and one which we may take to Africa, uh, depending upon priorities. I just wanted to make two general reflections before I pack up. Um, the, the first is that all of this in my mind is about how do we mature the earth observation supply chain? And I think that's of interest to, to everybody in the sense that what we're really doing here is working from on the left, our observing systems through to on the right, derived information and services that are direct use to people. Uh, and what we're seeing over time is a maturation from the left to the right of this. So our observing systems since 20, uh, 2008 
2012 when Copernicus came online around then, um, they've moved from being scientific, opportunistic, sometimes we'll do it, to being global systematic observing systems. The data has moved from being licensed or even paid $5,000 for an image, if you're that old, um, to being open data that is free. So there's, they have been huge enablers and that's been documented in the literature by Mike Wilder and others. Um, we're now moving into these, the sort of fourth and fifth boxes there that the making the data accessible and useful for future architectures through things like analysis ready data, cloud optimized geotiffs and stack is starting to become a norm. So the whilst, and that's happening through government and space agencies taking on specifications for analysis ready data, but it's also happening through the industry just pushing ahead with COG and stack as, as enablers. Um, through groups like Amazon and Google, we're seeing compute that's affordable and scalable and operational. So we're really pushing to the right. Um, and now with the data cube, um, we've got paradigms that use the whole data stack, the full temples time series. And that's getting us toward this right hand end where we're starting to be able to produce information and services and um, that people need. And so in my mind, we're moving from hardware on the left hand side through to what I want to see happen, which is the daily map of the land and water, a bit like a weather map of the land that should be producible on a daily basis, kind of almost pretty much wherever you are in the world. Um, so that maturation is, has obviously been very difficult. And I see it as a series of layers that, that enable things to, to grow in a sustainable way. Uh, and it's exciting to be in that process. My other reflection is that where we're coming from is the, the importance of partnership is if you look at how we achieve things in this space, it's not through one discipline alone. Um, the observations themselves are a discipline and they are how we measure the land. Um, and, you have, and we have specialists in that. If you look at how those observations vary through space and time, then we're into a statistical domain and that what's the quality and uncertainty around each observation. Uh, and we need that statistical domain to work the observational domain to get the data in a form we need. The science is about understanding what it is you're looking at when the color of the land changes and what that means for a process and therefore what you can say about the land cover or the environment. Um, the technology is the enabling platforms, the compute and the, the, uh, the, the web storage and the decision trees and the techniques we develop to actually scale the science so it can be potentially useful socially. And then the hardest part of all is the sociology, which is, is the people and the economics, the users. The, and what we're learning is that, and we all are, I think, is that not only does this have to be designed as a whole, um, when we get to that social part, uh, that can't be done last, it has to be done first. People, one of the key things we're doing is engaging our users, our partners with validation work, because we know that that's one way to get people socially engaged with products that they may want to use later. And if they don't know what they look like early, then they, they will be disinclined to take them up. So I, I'm seeing that none of us can actually, as specialists, we like to think we can, as smart people, we like to think we can do all these things, but in practice, we can't. So having partnerships that, that, that bring in all those components, um, and there's doubtless others, end up being vital to success. Now I'm going to finish there. Um, Joanna, apologies for going a little bit long. Uh, apologies to everyone for going a bit long. And here's a few links to um, further information. Yeah, thank you so much for a really inspiring uh, presentation. And, and I think everyone is uh, really impressed by this work. Um, I think I will start with a, with a question from me. And I, I'm really interested in the potential you see for decision makers to use this kind of tools and, and also um, how this can be done on a global scale <laughs> and what can we achieve if we can do this on, on, on a global scale. So if you can elaborate a bit on, on that one. One moment, I have to have a drink. I think there's vast potential, but I, I see us as creating opportunity uh, for more people to engage with the data and information that we have jointly at our, 
uh, at our disposal. And by, by moving closer to that, uh, through that supply chain, if we can provide products that decision makers can identify with, and not does it, I, don't, I think it's unrealistic to think that the products we make will, will lead to a decision, but what they will lead to is information that decision makers take on along with the other information they have. My experience in life is that when you want to make a decision, um, you have a range of things you're relying on and some great new piece of information may come along. You then integrate it into your ecosystem of decision making and give it due weight along with everything else. So I think it's not simple to, it's, that's the hardest part of all that last mile of how do I get this information I'm providing, which I sense is really important for this decision, could be really useful. How do I get that into decision makers, whether they're individual farmers or, or policy makers? That's the hardest mile to cross. And we have to use more and more partners and seek more and more opportunities to do it because even in well, wherever you go in the world, it doesn't, it's hard. Um, but I think we are, by making the products more accessible and available and ready to use, we're creating the opportunities where the decision makers who are who are ready for the for the idea, who are ready for the data and the service, will take it up and integrate it into their systems. And by being operational, we open up the prospect that more people will be trusting in this this rather than seeing it as just another research project that they that, that may be interesting, but you can't rely on it for the future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we have a bit uh, a related question here. Um, it's what are your experiences with national and regional government decision makers and involvement? And do they know what to ask for? And what knowledge is available possible with the data cube? Do you have any advice for a small regional government agent on how to get this sort of data more mainstream? So a lot of questions. You have it in the chat as well. <laughs> but uh, uh, I can't multitask very well. Um, reading and speaking at the same time. The, I think there's a couple of things in there. Um, one is, I mean, you talk about uh, re regional decision makers. Um, again, they'll have their own systems and, and problems. Uh, in a country like Australia, uh, everybody thinks they can do everything already. So the, the, the terrain is full. So if you come along with a new piece of information, um, people may say, well, I can already measure that. Why? Therefore, it's extra work to actually take on something new. One of the most exciting experiences in Australia, though, has been around drought mapping. Um, so one of the, in one of our states, um, they have a, a monthly drought, state of the drought, how dry is the countryside. And into that, we were able to gradually insinuate the product based on the WAFs product, which, and that was, was fine-tuned and re, reworked to measure how full each dam is. And then that gets added up. Now, the decision makers aren't really interested in how full each dam is per se. They want to know, they need to report on a local government area by local government area. So that has to be produced, demonstrated to be stable, added up to a local government area. And then that became one layer that they now use in, in monthly drought reporting for that regional government. So there was a, a need, it's something that could be improved, an existing system that could be slotted in with, uh, and then of course the personal relationships necessary to get the hearing and for it to move to move into practice. Uh, and we find um, that even where there's a, a really strong driving need, for example, we need improved water monitoring water in our Murray Darling Basin um, to support compliance as well as to understand what's happening in the environment. Um, there's a long path working with uh, the technicians and the specialists in things like water compliance, uh, identifying, getting their ideas on exactly what it is they could use, iterating that, and then feeding it in. And they wouldn't even be interested unless at the highest level, at the policy level, there was a driving question saying, we need better information to support this. So it, it's not easy. Uh, and sometimes the things you think are most obvious um, don't, don't take up. But the case of that DEA coastlines, one of the things we do know is that everybody in Australia is interested in the coastline. We have no other way of measuring where it's at and how it's changing and its erosion. Um, there will be people who are interested in that. We may not know who they are, but at least we're creating the opportunity for them to engage with it. 
So I don't think there's any formula that works, but one thing that's, but the numbers game says that if you can create opportunities for many people, then some of them will come out. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're moving on to a more technical question here. And that is, if it's preferable to build the whole analysis system in the data cube or to only have the satellite related part in the cube and then get the data results via API in your own system and continue the analysis there together with other relevant data? Oh, I think that's a good question. Um, I think as with most um, cases, I, I think that's a matter of what suits you most. Uh, there's nothing saying, I, I think the data cube as it now exists is, is sort of, whereas I conceptualized it as being about any geographic variable, I think it is relatively strongly tuned to satellite data. I think that became an inevitable um, consequence of the, the, the struggles and the technology to, to harness the satellite data. Um, it makes sense to have in the data cube data sets that are time series. Um, we are bringing additional data sets in that are that may not be time variant, like digital digital elevation models, um, and use those in the analysis. So ultimately, it's going to be wherever, it, however, it sits most efficiently for your particular problem. Um, so I think our tendency is to be bringing other data, ancillary data, into the data cube environment generating statistics from that uh, with that and using the whole time series. But it's really going to be horses for courses. Thank you. Oh. Um, yes, I'm scrolling through the questions here. We have a lot of questions. Um, so what are the trade-offs of having analysis ready data available? I oh, yeah, that was probably the one we took. We take yeah, here we have one about the completely in the cloud uh, solution. So you said that the Digital Earth Africa is, Africa is leading in some areas, which is uh, one was completely in the cloud. Why is the completely in the cloud so important? Um, I think if I, if I put a, the Africa hat on, completely in the cloud is important because in practice, it's very hard to sustain infrastructure and to, if it's in the cloud, then in principle, anybody in Africa could access it. Now, obviously, there is not always access to the cloud, which is a function of poor networks. Um, poor networks will ameliorate over time uh, and access to that. Basically, in the cloud, we can be sure that there's going to be increase. A, it's going to be sustained, and B, there'll be increasing accessibility of it to anybody in Africa. If we tried to put our own hardware in Africa, we would have a, um, an unsustainable burden of, of maintaining that. It would have to be replicated at multiple sites um, and it would fail. Uh, and so there's a massive step impetus there. If I put on my Australian government hat, um, I can tell you that in my, uh, I think in most people's view, uh, we can host data in the cloud more efficiently, sustainably, and cost effectively and securely than we can do it in a building. So the cloud to us has major benefits. Thank you. Um, and I also, before we move on, I think I will, if there are any of the panelists that want to ask Adam questions, you're very welcome to do so. <laughs> I don't know if I'm you have any. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions. No, I guess not. <laughs> okay, but then I, I think we should move on to the next uh, to the next uh, slot in our uh, agenda. But thank you so much for joining, uh, Adam. And uh, I think we will keep in touch in some way because we have a lot of, of, to learn uh, from a Swedish perspective, uh, as I see it. Um, yeah, thank you. And feel free to stay and listen, or uh, I guess it's a bit late at your <laughs> in Australia right now. So uh, you're also free to leave if you want. Thank you, Joanna. I, I will stay on and uh, I hope that's been useful for you guys. In some yeah, way. really useful. Thank you so much again. Um, great. Okay, so then we should move on to Europe and uh, the fee lab. 
Uh, and the Field Lab is a division of uh, European Space Agency Earth Observation Program and brings experts from across the world to develop research on the relevance for Earth observation of emerging technology topics, including AI, which we are really interested in from AI Sweden's perspective, of course. Um, so I want to welcome uh, Pierre-Philippe Mathieu, that is head of the Field Lab Explore Office, and Giuseppe Borghi, head of the Field Lab Division at European Space Agency. So please, um, feel free to share your screen and introduce yourselves. And welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Good morning. So my name is Giuseppe Borghi. Please confirm me you see me and hear me. Yes, we see you perfectly. Connection problem. Yeah, we hear you perfectly. So that's great. Okay. So thank you very much for uh, for the invite. And I'm really pleased to, to be here and uh, present what we do here at the uh, European Space Agency in, uh, in Frascati in Italy. And I have with me uh, my colleagues, Pierre-Philippe Mathieu. Pierre-Philippe, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? I see he's on mute. You, you seem to be on, to be muted. On mute. Okay, no problem. Uh, we had some, uh, some con issue connection because for us, Zoom is not an allowed tool. We have to go through the web browser and so on. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I so uh, I would say I would propose to go through a presentation of the FILAB, so to give uh, to all the audience uh, what what we do, and then Pierre Philippe uh, will go more in detail on uh, artificial intelligence uh, activity we do. So I start uh, with sharing uh, the screen. And Joanna, if you could confirm me that you see my screen. Not yet. Still not? No. Please grant. Uh, is, uh, the, the, the browser is asking for permission, authorization to share the screen. Give me one second. Sorry for this. Yeah, no problem. Okay, let me try again. Now we can see it. Okay, great. Do you see the screen? Eh? Is now is black. Yep. Okay. Okay. So uh, I forgot to mention that I'm uh, leading this uh, ISA Phil Lab since a few months. I joined ISA on the first of uh, of last year, June of last year. So the Phil Lab is an organization, is a division of uh, ISA beside the Earth Observation Program Directorate. And as Joanna said, uh, our uh, uh, mission is to accelerate the future of the Earth Observation. We do this uh, through what is called a transformational innovation or someone called disruptive innovation with the ultimate goal to uh, strengthen the European competitiveness in industry and uh, in the research. And the FILAB is a strange tool in ESA, but I think also more in general because we cover the complete uh, uh, what we call the innovation pipeline so we really start uh, from uh, the uh, creation of idea or identification of the idea in our ecosystem of industry or research institution and then we uh, develop the good one uh, create a solution internal into the into the philab but also we have the capability to invest uh, in uh, uh, commercially oriented uh, activities. So we have a fund, we manage a, a program which is called Incubed uh, that has 100 million euro of funding for uh, co-founding industry and uh, entrepreneur to really reach the market adoption of, uh, of the innovation. So we are located in uh, Ezrin, close to Rome in Frascati, and we, have, we are quite recent uh, organization we have been established in 2017. 
And we're about 20 people, but is uh, let's say the size of the lab is changing, uh, I would say, every month because we are a kind of open lab. So we host uh, uh, many people coming from industry or from uh, the just institution. So our size is going up and down. So roughly we are 20 people. About uh, an half is a staff, the rest are research fellow or visiting researchers from outside. We also have uh, about uh, 10 collaboration, signing collaboration with the uh, industry or research institution. And we have uh, also a scheme we call visiting professor scheme to uh, collaborate with leading professor in artificial intelligence for earth observation. So as I said, we cover the full pipeline. So we work uh, with uh, industry we research institution or we have internal capability to develop and uh, generate uh, innovative idea disruptive innovative idea and then we have uh, capability to test this idea and develop this up to as i said uh, investing with investors and with entrepreneur people so we have uh, five tools to implement our mission. We have the research lab where I am right now. It's, a, it's an open environment, it's an open lab. Uh, we have a program of challenges. So we identify a difficult problem in uh, earth observation. And then we put this problem to the community for uh, stimulating uh, ideas. We are growing a fill up community. There is a community set up that is growing day by day. We have what we call the invest action, that are all the action to help uh, entrepreneur to get access to investment. And then uh, we have a series of flagship program where we uh, plan to deliver, let's say, our innovation. In terms of uh, uh, technology access, so where we really work uh, uh, internally, we have three axes of activity. So the main one, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence and more specifically machine learning for uh, earth observation. So again, everything we do is for earth observation. We have recently started an initiative that is called a quantum computing for earth observation. And the intent, uh, the goal is to uh, use quantum computing to solve uh, demanding earth observation problems of the future. <clears throat> and we work also with uh, uh, topics like Internet of Things, uh, blockchain, or cognitive space. Where do we apply this innovation? Uh, we apply to all uh, elements of a space system, so flight hardware, flight software, uh, downstream application, or complete system, satellite system, or innovative business model. So about 50%, for example, of the investment that we do through NQ program is uh, uh, on flight asset, on flight hardware or flight software. In terms of successes, despite we are quite a new organization, we sh should mention uh, two AI power satellites. One has been already launched in September. We have uh, contributed to the burn of this uh, satellite and to the uh, definition of the artificial intelligence uh, engine that is in, uh, in this uh, nano satellite. It has been launched on the 2nd of September last year. And we are now supporting ESA organization for the development of the second FISAT satellite, nano satellite, uh, that will expand artificial intelligence capability in space. As I said, we have about 10 collaboration. We are very keen to expand uh, our collaboration, and that's what, one of the main reasons why we talk uh, with you today. Uh, we have hosted up to now 18 visiting researchers from uh, outside HISA. And as I said, we have an in queue program running uh, with 100 millions. And this program has already uh, financed 20 activities, which is quite a lot. So there are 20 contracts running at the moment for about 37 million of these. Uh, 100 million, so we are about a third of this uh, investment, uh, and we have uh, financed this activity for about 56% uh, co-founding rate. 
we are helping uh, uh, the European ecosystem to set the uh, European R&D agenda on artificial intelligence for uh, Earth observation. So we are recognized as a uh, leader of this. The 10 visiting professor in terms of publication, although it is not something, uh, uh, it's, let's say, our main goal to uh, generate publication, but we have already published about 20 papers in conference and in international journals. There are about another 10 uh, going through. In terms of organization, there are two <clears throat> offices inside the field lab. There is the Explore office, which is led by Pierre Philippe Mathieu, and we will have the possibility to talk with him later, where we generate internal uh, uh, innovation. So, where we have a, a team of researchers led by Pierre Philippe, and where we generate internally the idea. And then we have a second office, which is called the Invest Office, which is the office that takes the idea either from inside or mainly from outside, and then invest on this idea to deliver to the market. So, uh, in terms of what we do in 2D uh, Explore Office, I can give you some example of use cases, and Pierre Philippe will be more precise on this. Here you can see on the top left uh, an activity we have done uh, with Satchen uh, about the identification and monitoring of infrastructure inside into the desert region, so in Sahara region. On the top right, uh, you see an um, emulator of an RTM model for a Copernicus Sentinel 5P uh, methane retrieval uh, algorithm. So this is a, a neural network based uh, emulator that uh, emulates the uh, results of a numerical model and it achieves re about 97% accuracy, but it runs 10,000 times faster than the numerical model. So it cannot reach the same accuracy of the numerical model, but it runs much, much, much faster. On the top left, sorry, on the bottom left, there is an activity that we have done with UNICEF and WFP on uh, identify crop types using uh, emerging of data from satellite, in particular Copernicus Sentinel-2 and drones. And on the right, you see an uh, activity we have done with an industry that is also here now in, uh, in the FILA, which is ISI, is one of the leaders worldwide for uh, SAR data, or synthetic aperture radar data. In terms of uh, flagship program, I mentioned the, the Quantum Computer Initiative. That's an initiative that we have started uh, in September last year in cooperation with CERN. And we will develop this year also expanding with other partners uh, in, uh, in the future. Another very important initiative is an European Commission initiative. It is called Destination Hurt. And the goal of this initiative is to generate uh, uh, what are called uh, digital twins, and in particular, a, a series of digital twins of the herd. The digital twin is defined as an extremely accurate copy of uh, the herd, which is AI enabled, with the goal to allow decision maker, so uh, policy maker or regional decision maker or scientist, to make prediction and define policy in a very accurate way. So a typical problem that we want to face is what will happen if a certain industrial policy is applied regionally in Europe to the, I don't know, concentration of CO2 and NO2 in the next 20 years. So this tool should allow the decision maker to take decision on policy, what to do for the best of uh, uh, Europe and for the best of the planet. So ESA, together with ESA and WF, EUMESAT will lead this activity, and the FILAB will be responsible for the artificial intelligence element of it. This is some picture I, about the FISAT-1 satellite that I mentioned before. So the algorithm and the 
uh, engine that is running on this uh, satellite, this nano satellite, is used to compute what is called the cloud mask. Uh, the cloud mask is a, 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 the output of an algorithm that needs to detect uh, in an image taken from an hyperspectral uh, uh, imager that you see here in the center, the region of the image that are covered by cloud, because these are regions that cannot be used for scientific or application purposes. And so the cloud mask indicates the probability that each pixel, that one pixel has to be a cloud or to be, let's say, an image of the ground. And this cloud mask is used then to decide whether an image can be downloaded, should be downloaded, and how it should be compressed in order to reduce the use of the, uh, let's say, scarce bandwidth of the download of data from the, uh, from the nano satellite. The algorithm is running on this uh, uh, system on chip, uh, which is a, a Myriad uh, two chip from Intel. And we have already completed the commissioning and it's working very, very well. Few words about uh, the Invest Office. So the Invest Office is uh, working with three lines. One is the co-investment program where we, as I said, provide investment uh, to entrepreneur to develop their idea and to reach the market adoption. The invest action, which is the, all the activity we do to help industry to get access to additional uh, risk capital uh, funding or to help them to develop their business case. And the fill-up community where we try to foster industry to industry and industry to academia synergies to, to find, to, to to, to connect the dot between idea that are between industry or between industry and academia. About the invest action, that will be my uh, last slide, is, uh, uh, as I said, an investment program where you can uh, have a look and you can go to search on the ESA website uh, and search for Incube and you will find the website uh, that we give you all the information necessary to apply for this uh, program. And it has been designed to be very, how can I say, industry friendly, to be easy to be assessed, uh, uh, let's say much easier than to be assessed for other ESA programs that are quite complicated sometimes to be, to be let's say, uh, applied. Uh, it foreseen a series of steps where the uh, entrepreneur or the company comes just with a pitch presenting the business idea and then we will support uh, uh, this company to develop the idea and to uh, generate the proposal what is called the so-called committing proposal to apply for the granting of the uh, of the fund for the development of the idea in this uh, framework, uh, Incube is just a part of all the funding that a company can get access in Europe to get, uh, let's say, support the development of technologies. And we act as uh, a broker or as a support to this company to get access to also other uh, type of funding, also from, uh, uh, let's say, private investors, not only. Uh, through ESA. I would say this uh, uh, conclude my presentation. This give you, uh, let's say, an overview of what we do at the FILAB. And I'm very happy to take any question in case uh, we have it. Thank you so much. And please ask if you have any questions. You can use the chat or the Q&A uh, box. Uh, but but I can probably start. So yeah, I have a, a question. If where do you see the greatest potential of AI or machine learning in relation to Earth observation? I mean, now uh, AI is becoming uh, uh, every day more a kind of adopted tool. A few years ago was uh, let's say. Uh, an innovation that was difficult to be, let's say, introduced into the space environment. The space environment is quite conservative. 
but now I think this taboo has been broken also thanks to my colleagues here to the FILAB that were the, the one of the people pushing uh, in, uh, in ESA to do that so now uh, we have demonstrated that uh, artificial intelligence can work in space for a technology demonstrator like FISAT-1 but now ESA is working to adopt these in operational mission so ESA is launching uh, new uh, mission, six new mission for Earth observation in a program that called the uh, Sentinel expansion. And we are working in ESA to a making study to identify which mission can really take advantage of artificial intelligence for application. For example, uh, hyperspectral data is uh, a, a big candidate of this because hyperspectral mission are prone of generating uh, a large quantity of data, a huge quantity of data that is very difficult to download because it will stress the bandwidth of the satellite. So the possibility to make uh, computation in space uh, and to decide which are the real images that are interesting for the purposes or even to detect, uh, I mean, uh, events or uh, classify objects or, I mean, move from the level of data to really the information on space will, of course, uh, increase uh, the autonomy of this kind of satellite, okay? And then there are all the uh, activity that can be done, as I said, to increase the autonomy, like uh, deciding operation uh, instead of that on ground, because uh, usually, or currently, all satellites are completely managed from ground, to increase the autonomy on space and looking more in the future the big step will be to go in the direction of what is called the iot of sp in space so to have a constellation of satellites that they share resources and autonomously coordinate for a task and they decide what to do to deliver a task to uh, our, our uh, user on the ground so instead of having separated satellite that they deliver just data, the trend is to move to coordinated satellite that deliver information, actionable insight, not only images and pixels that then need to be processed. That's the, the future where we are sure we are going now, and we are uh, working in that direction to, to foster this innovation. Yeah, thank you. Really interesting. Um, do we have any more questions? Yeah. I will into the Q&A box here. Um, yes, we have a question here. Uh, you mentioned some use cases. Are there more info about them available? And can you provide a link, perhaps? Yes, we, we can provide a link. Uh, there is a, a nice document uh, that has been prepared uh, last year. Describe the philosophy of the Explore Office. Uh, and a series of use cases that we have run in, uh, in the FILAB. So it is a kind of document that is always obsolete because it talks about what has been done, but give also some uh, inspiration on what uh, we will do in the future. Yes, I can share with you and then uh, you can share with all the audience. Yes, perhaps we can share it in the chat. Um, yeah, otherwise I share it afterwards. Um, we have another question here, which is, is there machine learning for on-site data streams? Uh, yeah, I don't quite understand what you mean. Is there machine learning for on-site data stream? What, what does it really mean? Yeah, I don't really... For on-site data stream. The drones. Yes, sure. As I said, we are working, one of these use cases that we I showed before is exactly the merging of data from drones to satellite to generate uh, crop type uh, identification. We also work uh, on uh, Internet of Things, uh, so on uh, in situ sensor, network of in situ sensor to correlate the data taken from uh, in situ, so in the field, with data that you get from satellite to uh, reach a different level of uh, scalability okay because sentinel 2 has a, a ground resolution of several tens of meter 
but in several cases you need to go down to one meter or even less than one meter. So the coordination of data from satellite, from drones, from in situ is certainly a very important topic. Thank you. And we have another question here, which is, what do you intend to do in destination Earth? Uh, if the question is what we as ESA intend to do, uh, so as I said, we will be responsible of uh, the artificial intelligence element. There are two elements where we will work. So there are several aspects of developing uh, an algorithm for modeling, for example, uh, very difficult uh, uh, physical processes. For example, the emulator that I showed before or integration of model with uh, heterogeneous data. So you can have model that are numerical model with model that are symbolic model. So you can use artificial intelligence to merge heterogeneous data. But we will also work on what is called a, a, the open framework of Destination Earth. So it will be a kind of open platform for the community. At the beginning will be a restricted community of, let's say, specialists that they can develop uh, using this framework inside Destination Earth, their own uh, specific digital twin. And the intention of the European Commission is to evolve this uh, uh, framework to make in the medium term a really an open environment for all the European community to exploit what is Destination Earth, uh, I mean, horizontal layer, so the infrastructure, the artificial intelligence layer, the modeling layer, and add verticals of specific digital twins for specific community. Uh, the European Commission will start to develop together with us two destination, two, digi two digital twins, one on extreme hurt, which means uh, what will happen uh, in case of extreme events uh, on Earth due to, for example, climate change. And another one, which is called climate adaptation, that is what uh, we should do as a community to adapt to the climate change that is ongoing. This will be the first two digital twins that will be developed. Thank you so much. Um, do we have more questions from the audience? Of course, also the panelists can ask questions if they have any. <laughs> um, but I don't see any more uh, questions. I see that Philip has already shared the link to the research and innovation strategy document. So, all audience can download uh, from that link. It's quite big, so you need to be patient. That's really good. And if I think there, there are several opportunities to collaborate with you. So either if you are a, a scientist um, or a researcher, then you, yeah. you can collaborate. You also have uh, this program um, for like industry and, uh, and innovators and things like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You, you, you're right. So I think we should point out this. As I said, the Philab is a really an open lab. So it's very easy to collaborate with us. Uh, we can collaborate simply by sharing an interest and decide that there is something interesting for uh, ESA and uh, the Research Institute or the industry. And so there is a, co a collaboration based on, uh, I mean, no exchange of found. There could be collaboration based on uh, visiting research. So the research institution or the industry send to the FILAB. Right now, of course, we have... Uh, the limitation of COVID, but in principle, sent to us uh, a researcher that can stay in the FILAB for, I don't know, a crash course of a few weeks, or we have people stay in the FILAB for two years. We can have uh, uh, processes of uh, co-founded PhD, for example. We can share co-founded, or we have open position of, we have right now, open position of research fellow. We are uh, actively looking for candidate for our research fellow uh, program. And if you go on the ESA website, you will see there are uh, one or two positions open exactly right now. 
and I, again, uh, there are collaboration industrial level where we, uh, let's say, place contract or we provide funding to develop uh, business-oriented ideas. There are many, many different uh, ways to collaborate. So my suggestion is if anyone has an idea for collaboration, just write to me or to Pierre Philippe. We will yeah. find the, the good way to do it. Thank you so much. And then I will also let in uh, Pierre Philippe and talking about the AI activities, of course. Um, so you can unmute yourself and share your screen. Thank you very much. Sir. And I put myself on mute. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Can you see this? Yes, we see it. Can you hear me? Yes. And can you see me? Yes. And we are all set. So thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, thanks for uh, Giuseppe to make my uh, job uh, simple because he introduced most of the things uh, of the field lab. So I will concentrate mainly on the use cases uh, with AI, which is done through uh, contract with industry and startups, but also internally within the Philab uh, researcher team. And this is the plan. Um, I will not talk about the AI revolution because you are very educated on this, but I will explain why it's happening in our field of Earth observation. I will then tackle why uh, it has massive implication on the way we do infrastructure and tools and how it changes the business model. Then I will mention briefly how we bring AI in space and then conclude with the major topics. And you see again the link to the document there that has been shared in the chat. Uh, as you know, AI has many definitions. For me, it's the ability to solve problems, but I really like this definition of intelligence. And you know, it has a, a variety of forms. But the ability to adapt uh, is very important. And I will show this with the observation we are making and how this observation then self can adapt uh, with AI itself so that they become uh, intelligent in that sense. So as you know, AI is uh, really perversive, entering all aspects of life, life with different uh, cognitive function. Uh, from natural language to autonomy to computer vision uh, for self-driving car. Uh, most of the things I will talk about is related to the vision aspects, how to interpret automatically what's in the data. And uh, you all know that the deep learning revolution uh, was triggered uh, with ImageNet and uh, in particular in uh, 2012. But it came to our community with a time lag. And you can see here it came strongly to our community. So there is a massive adoption of deep learning in the way we are doing things. And that's why we need to connect with you guys, because uh, we need AI talent to address big problem of the planet. That's my main message today. We, we basically need you. Because AI is just a tool, our focus is this. Uh, we have only one, uh, no plan B so far. And uh, what we do at the space agency is we put a microscope on it to understand what's happening on the planet. Then we turn this into information for other people uh, to make decision, hopefully good ones, but at least they are informed decision. And to do that, we build an observing system with different components. Uh, some are for the research, some are for the metrology, and so some are for the monitoring of the environment. This is our main focus today. And this system is called uh, Copernicus, and it's based on a family of sentinels scanning the whole electromagnetic spectrum from optical to radar, atmospheric chemistry, etc. And then we have uh, new boys in town, new players uh, with a small SAT, agile system, etc. So the big, big uh, challenge is to put all this together, mix it, and get a kind of microscope on the state of the planet. So not only individual observation, but an integrated picture, a kind of synthetic lens that can be reproduced by software. And the issue we have is 
that we are really rich. So it's, it's in fact a big opportunity, uh, re really rich in ESA, but in terms of data, but the data are free. The, uh, the richness of this is really the information. And the problem we have is the size of the problem, the variety of the problem, different sensors, different error, different sampling. So we need to find this needle in this haystack. And the way to do that is uh, mainly machine learning because you need a scalable way of doing it and an automatic way of doing it. If this gentleman was looking at our data, it would take him centuries to find information with the number of pixels we are dealing, trillion pixel challenge. So we are looking at this in the field lab and looking at different aspects of the use, mainly computer vision, as I mentioned, for detection and classification, but also analytics, indicators, autonomy, uh, Giuseppe mentioned autonomy on board, automation as well, the ability to do things uh, in a scalable and automatic way, and also super resolution, the ability to enhance by software the capability of your sensors. Very, very interesting. So what we try to do in the field lab is take a tensor view of the data. Uh, you see the unit here. And we try to use this tensor view to transform these petabyte into a few um, information nuggets that are of very high value. Where are the forest? How many trees? Where is the oil spill, etc. And to do that, we spend a lot of time in doing the things on the left side, which is the data preparation. Then we use open software in the middle that is available online, for example, to classify cats and dogs. We retrain it to classify geospatial and magic. We can then classify crops, oil, oil spill, etc. So our work has changed. It's mainly in the data preparation business and the interpretation of the data. This is an example we did with um, the Satsen, they gave us a map of a uh, remote uh, desert area. And uh, we found, thanks to the radar, some new infrastructure here that then updated their map. So it was automatized with uh, machine learning. We also looked at the impact of the COVID and used uh, super resolution techniques uh, because we wanted to count uh, the number of planes that were grounded. We don't see this in Sentinel-2 properly, but by combining high-res Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, we could train the algorithm to spot that. We can also uh, use unsupervised learning. This is the new frontier to automatically understand, um, how can I express this? How the data is structured. So this thing will tell you all the different classes based on the reflectance, and then you would come with a supervised learning scheme to understand exactly what it is. And it works very well. We apply it to water bodies here. And you can have more info in the document I sent. We also look at issue of transfer learning. This is just an amazing uh, capability of machine learning whereby uh, you train a data on a uh, train algorithm, sorry, on drone data, very high res and very Lo uh, localized data. And then you try to expand in space the capability by transferring it to Sentinel to a 10 meter resolution, but global. And this is a very exciting um, frontier. Uh, the World Food Program is really keen on this. Uh, they want to deploy drone in a smart way uh, using this technique so that we get a full representativeness of the sampling because as you all know, um, garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't get the good training data, you get the wrong output. This is an example of super resolution with um, multi-angle satellite uh, that we release as a challenge. And indeed, the community got very excited and we got a very good algorithm to increase uh, this resolution. We want now to apply this to Sentinel-2. Uh, the next uh, very exciting frontier is this interaction between machine learning and science that goes uh, in different way. Uh, machine learning helping scientists to look at patterns they didn't see, or also to reproduce models by emulating them, as Giuseppe mentioned. 
and then science feeding the machine learning by coding directly into the, uh, the algorithm some properties. And to do that, we, we are ex exploratory mode. This is a data cube that we produce with different variables so that a scientist can dive into it and understand pattern in the Earth system, like uh, the impact of El Nino on different aspects of uh, the ocean, land, atmosphere, etc. automatically. And then they come with an interpretation and understanding of mechanism underpinning these patterns because as you know, you can always find correlation. Uh, we have seen recently that deep learning is able to retrieve uh, some physical equations like understanding that the sun is at the center of the world. So it did what Copernicus or um, uh, Aristarchus did uh, in years or Kepler with the orbit, he did it in a, a few minutes and they can retrieve uh, inherent properties and that's something we want to, to look at as well for science. We're also releasing research sprints like this FDL, Frontier Development Lab, with uh, pairing AI expert with EO experts to work during uh, intensive full-time eight weeks on one topic. Here the topic was how can you predict rain? And there are very good models to do that. Uh, you know, it's one of the most challenging variables to predict. And what the team has shown is that they can reproduce these models with a very light statistical approximation, reaching the same accuracy. And because it makes it more performant, like several other magnitudes, suddenly you can benchmark and you can also use it in Africa where there are less capabilities, but a lot of need for precipitation information. And this is the, the, the model I was talking about. It's called PyRain. You can download it from there. So all this feed into what uh, Giuseppe introduced, which is the digital twin Earth, uh, bringing observation model and AI together to get the best understanding of the planet. It also changed the way we do business. We do the value chain, where you have now uh, a big uh, data preparation aspects, a training, we want to develop a kind of app store in the fill up and then deploy it both on Earth and at the edge. And you see, for example, the new business model of planet, you choose a region of the world and it uh, gives you analytics in real time on what's happening by counting the ship, counting the infrastructure, quantifying the health of the field, etc. So it totally opened new doors uh, for our friend in the business sector and new startups. <clears throat> so in the field app, we try to provide the tools to this community to do that. We are doing annotation of data. We are doing gaming to get annotation. We are providing routine for hyperspectrals. So all of this is free and available on GitHub, the open SAR toolkit to really use new layer like coherence in the machine learning. And we also try uh, to deploy this at the edge uh, by trying to simplify all these big machine learning scheme with several hundred million parameters into very light agile version that can run on a chip. And if they run on a small chip that we put on a satellite, suddenly you can download a very small information directly from the satellite. So you bypass all the ground segment, all the processing chain, and you get the most relevant information in a timely manner. So again, this opens a new opportunity for the community. And one, one example was the FISAT one. So to conclude, I think machine learning, Earth observation is a very exciting field. Uh, we need AI talents. Uh, we believe that the future of space is the connection of all these sensors and making them smarter and acting smarter as a network, like a swarm intelligence. Uh, we want uh, to have some use cases of this together with you. And uh, to do that, we need to better understand uh, the machine learning aspects. Uh, there are many questions, uh, the physics aspects, the reasoning, the transfer learning, the ability to generalize things, how to quantify uncertainty and demystifying the black box in order to uh, enable 
uptake, the ability to automize the machine learning scheme itself, AutoML, the whole business of GAN to create synthetic data about our planet and quantum computing. And I conclude here with a challenge that we will release next month about super resolution of air quality. And I invite you to visit this website to, to get information about this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really interesting presentation. And, and from an AI, of AI Sweden perspective, I see that we have a lot of um, things in common that we're interested in looking into. So I see several ways of uh, collaborating from, from my per personal perspective. So that's really good. Uh, do we have any questions from, from the audience? It doesn't seem like that. So either it was clear, either I was on mute. Yeah, you were not on mute at least. Okay, good. <laughs> so that's good. So one comment again, uh, AI has the beauty of being totally agnostic. It can be applied to totally different fields. That's why the collaboration is made very easy with people who have nothing to do with the space sector. And that's why I love to be in webinars like this to attract all these talents. And in particular, we have a open postdoc position available. I will share the link. So if anybody is interested, please apply because uh, I think it's a job of the future. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I will see if we have, maybe we have some questions. Uh, yes, the comments here that it was a very interesting presentation and a lot of new, uh, new things. So that's really good. Okay, then I think we should take a five minute break. Um, so please be back here in five minutes and then we will zoom into the Swedish perspective and uh, listening to Tobias and Jörgi and about the Swedish Space Data Lab and the Swedish Data Cube. So please come back here in, in uh, five minutes and we, then we start again. Okay, thank you so much. by asking you a question actually before we move on to your presentation and, and that is just your reflections on the presentations we just heard from Adam and from from the field lab. Yes I really want to start with thanking Adam, Giuseppe and uh, Pierre Philippe. I think it was really really interesting and they are doing a really good job. So I, I, I would consider them as raw models for us. Uh, they are a bit ahead. We uh, from the Swedish National Space Agency, we really see the National Space Data, Swedish Space Data Lab as uh, a way to contribute to this global process and global cooperation on how to handle and how to analyze space data in a good way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I think we have a lot to to learn and but but also get inspired by um, and really I really feel that we are on the right track um, and that we of course should learn from from others that already done things um, that's a, a really good reflection um, so we will start by you presenting this Swedish uh, initiative or project that we have together to be as, and then also Jörgi from um, Luleå Technical University will talk a bit about the AI perspective in relation to, to the Swedish Space Data Lab. But we start with you, uh, Tobias, so you can uh, share your screen and yes, also um, introduce yourself, of course. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, while I'm finding, let's see. Should be there. Uh, so my name is uh, Tobias Edman. I work at a Swedish National Space Agency with innovation and uh, public benefit. And uh, I will uh, introduce the Swedish Space Data Lab here today, which is an initiative that uh, started in 2019. So we are a bit 
behind, but also very inspired by both the P-Lab and uh, Digital Earth uh, Australia to start with. And uh, <clears throat> we build it mainly on Copernicus data. That's the natural starting point, I would say, working with Earth observation today, as that's a pillar in uh, providing free and open data of high quality at a global scale. <clears throat> and um, one of the backgrounds, as we've seen before, is this tremendous uh, rise in the available uh, data availability, starting with, uh, we could say starting with Landsat 1, 1972, and a collection of data, which gave, gave new insights, especially for the Americans, of course, but then continuing to working on uh, leveraging this and getting more and more data. And now we are into the haystack, I would say, with uh, just from uh, Copernicus, I think it's 20 petabytes per year that's, uh, <clears throat> that's downloaded. So it's really a need for new ways and good ways to handle this. And that's one of the reasons to start a Swedish national or the Swedish space data lab. And it's a collaboration with the uh, Lulotechniska Universitet, RISE, and Lindholm and Science Park. It's part of the AI Sweden. So uh, it's part of the AI data factory. It's based on the Open Data Cube and it's uh, financed by Rim Sturson, the Swedish National Space Agency. And then also by, and to a large extent, by Vinova and uh, SMHI. So it's a co funded cooperation for better use of space data and to really leverage the power of AI. And uh, the main idea behind it is that you have the satellites. We don't have all the satellites right now, but this, these are the Sentinel satellites of the Copernicus program. At the moment, we have uh, Sentinel-2 and some Sentinel-3 data within the lab. And we use the data cube. <clears throat> oh, sorry. We use the data cube to uh, index the data and to make it uh, available in a programmatically good way. And then uh, the idea is where we will heading is to have, uh, as it is a national space data lab, we also want national data to be available to make this uh, part of the full ecosystem of different data cubes and different initiatives. So it shouldn't be much overlapping, it should be a cooperation. We want to be able to use climate and geodata, specific national Swedish data, etc., and uh, provide this in an analysis ready format so that you either for programming or to be reached by APIs, for example. And the main goal is to have information for decision support and presentation of data, of course. And also to have this, as I think it was just Sefi showed how this could be like an engine for innovation, the P lab. And we also see that the Swedish Space Data Lab should be an engine for innovation. And uh, it's based on open data from the Copernicus program. And we want to make as much of the development as possible as open development. So free and open data, use for, to a large extent for governmental needs, but not no, only, but we see that it's a need for governmental agencies in Sweden to have this collaborative platform to work with. And then it should also be open source development and the results and the code should be published in the open domain. The process chart of uh, the Space Data Lab and uh, where we are now, and this is for how to work with governmental needs. It's, uh, there are uh, Swedish agencies with common problems and common challenges. They can have specific challenges as well. But then uh, the Space Data Lab should help to identify these challenges and formulate them. And then working with procurements, innovation competitions, hackathons, etc. <clears throat> work with uh, service providers and, 
SMEs, researchers, students, to develop open code and open libraries for public benefit, but also to get a common capacity building. So we should have a higher capacity and become a benefit. And then this should go back to the governmental needs, new challenges, etc. And this is sort of the engine of building a common capacity. And the activities that we foresee and uh, have worked with are these. So we have uh, come to this line here. We have had a kickoff. We have started the data cube. We have had some pilots. We have worked with governmental needs. Now we're in a phase where we need to work with the evaluation of uh, the space data lab and how to continue. And also different kind of requirements. What should the space data lab be? For whom and how should this cooperation be done? We need to work with the funding. We have uh, secured funding from the space agency to some, to some extent so that we know that the space data lab will continue. But we also need to see how should more organizations be involved and how should the common capacity of the data lab be expanded. We also need to work more with commercial development. It is open for uh, development, but the main focus has so far been on governmental needs to be able to kickstart this engine of capacity building. And that's why we're working with the pilots and um, have not focused on, <clears throat> on commercial users. But the main goal should be that it should be a full data lab. And then of course, if you are a commercial user, you can't probably not work only with Swedish data, but you could have this as a lab and a workbench to see what kind of analysis should be used on more global data sets. We also work closely within the agency cooperation regarding Copernicus. So it's uh, 18 Swedish, Swedish agencies that work together with Copernicus and how to use the Copernicus data in a good way. And uh, the Space Data Lab has to some extent come from the needs that have been expressed by these agencies. There are a lot of common needs and also specific needs as said. And then there is a need for this workbench, this lab, where these needs can be elaborated and where where different kinds of services can be provided. It's also in line with the European interoperability framework. We try to work with that. So we work with the principles of open data, open development, open access, open source, and, and building a common capacity. And uh, <clears throat> so that's also one important part, which we also will develop to make sure that the codes are made available in a good way and are reusable to build this common capacity. And uh, we also want to see the uh, Space Data Lab as a building block, a building block in a digital infrastructure where the Open Data Cube and the Space Data Lab can work together with other governmental data and the Copernicus service, for example. So, and, um, and that's, I said one, one of the targets to have this as a, as a workbench and as a resource for Swedish governmental use. Uh, we also work with, uh, from the space agency and from the data lab with the climate change and global development goals. The government of Sweden has increased the Swedish national space agency budget for data exploitation focused on climate change and global development with 6 million euros during the coming three years. And then, of course, the Swedish state, Space Data Lab would be an important asset in that effort to be able to develop and uh, develop analysis methods and information based on space data. And then, of course, international collaboration is important and welcomed, for example, with the PhiLab or with uh, the Open Data Cube Consortium. And, uh, we see the sustainable development goals as really important. And we think that space data and space data analysis is a good way, 
is one of the ways and one important building block to be able to work with this. And uh, where there are some examples how this could be used. <clears throat> for example, for zero hunger, we've been working with draft. And this is from uh, Skåne in 2017 and 2018. And uh, it's a uh, July composite. And uh, you, you can all see that 2018, for example, was a really extreme year with uh, very dry conditions in large parts of Sweden, especially in uh, southern Sweden. The nitrogen dioxide and the pollution can be traced from space. This is an example of uh, clean water where you can follow different kind of not, not doesn't have to be pollutions, but this is uh, lagan with a lot of uh, organic material that is coming out into the into the sea, and you can see the influence of the fresh water out in the sea. It's also important for uh, transparency, space data, and the, the global coverage means that you can actually you can't hide anymore. It's really wherever you are doing something, it's visible. And uh, I think that's important. It's not like the big brother sees you, I would say. It's like uh, more, if you do something, you should stand for it. And uh, space data can give this kind of transparency and make sure that we have uh, good chains of materials and good production wherever it takes place. You can also follow the vegetation in cities, for example, to see how green is the city. And in this example here, it's possible to see that you have a plastic football field, for example. It seems all green in the red, green, and blue light. But if you use the infrared light as well, you can see that you have some pl plastic fields. And uh, that's also one way to be sure that we have a good life quality and good environment surrounding us can follow the melting of glaciers, algal blooms are clearly visible. And you can also, and this is an example from Alice Springs in Australia, where you can, where you can follow the effects, for example, of the COVID pandemic. With uh, the airplanes uh, on the, with the closed airstrip in 2020, in January, and then on the 18th of January this year, where you can see it's uh, a lot of planes grounded and a lot of work being done. And this is one of the clear visible effects of the pandemic. And then we have the data lab within the space data lab, the actual servers, and they are situated in uh, Luleå at Rice. And it's uh, important for us that we have the data in a data lab and that we can work both with how to analyze the data and how to actually work with the data and the servers, etc. So it's, um, in, the, in that sense, it's like a holistic data lab that we want to be able to work with all aspects of the data management anal analysis. And it's also a, a very powerful data center with a lot of, uh, lot of storage and a lot of uh, compute capacity. And uh, what's good is that it's a research data lab. So we can actually make research about how to make research or how to work with the data at least. And uh, it's a lot of compute power and storage at the same, same place. We work, as I said, with open software as much as possible and the development should then be open as well. And uh, working with Open Data Cube, it facilitates the analysis of large amounts of data as so we got a, got the indexing and we got this uh, framework to work with. And we have this global community where we can share experiences and uh, also have the support if that's needed. 
we're working with Jupyter Hub at the moment, and that's the sandbox that, uh, or it's a part of the sandbox that uh, Adam was talking about. So we also have a server solution for the Jupyter, so you can have several different Jupyter notebooks so that you can really have your own power and analysis capacity when you are logged in to the system. And you can, this means also that you can have private data and shared data and you can separate them in a good way. And uh, so far we have uh, mostly worked with pilots as we are still building the National Space Data Lab. And um, the interest to having pilots have been uh, really huge. So we've been working from the beginning with vegetation in uh, Lake Bannon and drought in Lake Mellaren region. That was the two first pilots. And uh, then we have continued with uh, vegetation mapping in shallow waters, water quality assessment, mobile activity, API access, and AI for CAP are coming projects, and also changes in coastal zones. And I will uh, talk a little bit about each, pro each of these pilots. So the first one was uh, drought in uh, Lake Maladalen. It's um, initiated by uh, the county boards surrounding Maladalen, and especially since the 2018 uh, drought, which was quite severe. So that's uh, the main reason for the focus. And it's also about showcasing how to use satellite data and. Um, how to work with it in relation to climate change. And uh, so we set up, a, set up a study where we looked at uh, permanent grasslands and uh, made a uh, algorithm to, uh, to be able to see when are they diverging from normal. And it's uh, based on Bayesian statistics which um, lower the, uh, strengthen the significance of the, of the analysis in a good way. And as you, you can see, there are strong differences and, and there are actually differences between each of the years. I think the significance intervals are quite narrow and you can, and it's, sorry. And, and this can then be used as some, some kind of alarm, sy alarm systems to see, okay, so things are normal and now they are starting to diverge. And this signal can be sent out quite early, much earlier than earlier than when you are at these kind of really severe drought situations. We have also worked with uh, Vannon. Lake Vannon has, uh, is a, has a water regulation as it's a power dam in, uh, Trollhättan, and um, so it's uh, handled as a reservoir. And this is uh, not very beneficial for the shoreline uh, vegetation, both above and below water. And um, the counterboards around the lake, uh, Vannon also wanted to be able to analyze this in a good way and not uh, more efficient than uh, only be relying on uh, on field visits. So this was a tool that was made by Metia to be able to analyze the shoreline in a good way. And uh, the more data that comes into the cube, the more powerful this way of working with the data will be. Then we have this pilot to work with marine shallow water habitats in Sweden. The, the work is done by DHI, DHI, and it's uh, it's for uh, the counterboard of Westerbotten, but it's a national data set, which uh, <coughs> or de ne national tool to uh, analyze vegetation in shallow waters, and this is uh, of course important for planning purposes and to follow the quality of the marine habitat.
and uh, SMHI is working on Pilot 4 with water quality analysis. And uh, so they are setting up a production environment or analysis for an environment for water quality parameters and uh, to work with the uh, data flow of the satellite images and also to see how you can work with the PyTrol and SetPy libraries within the open and the open data cube in combination. Oh, here should be a pilot five, I think, but pilot six, I think I missed. I don't know. And this is uh, coming work, which uh, will be done uh, together with Jubilee Sverket, Skogsdjursand and Havsund Vattemyndigheten to look at the APIs for Space Data Lab access. At the moment, we have uh, the, uh, let's see, we have the Jupyter Notebooks, which is the way to interact with Open Data Cube. But there are also a lot of other ways that are developed. So we could have uh, different web services like uh, WMS services working with Open Data Cube. You could work with different kinds of statistics, uh, have this web user interface, etc. And much of this was shown by uh, Adam before. And uh, in this project, we want to implement those functions as well, and uh, also continue to develop to see how we can have them to work with the needs of these three agencies. Pilot 7 is uh, part of the national uh, of <coughs> Nationalt Mark Take Data. So it's uh, vegetation mapping and land cover mapping of Sweden. And uh, this pilot will look at how, how you can work with more dynamic mapping. So it's uh, water mapping and mapping of the water dynamics. And it will, of course, then be for, from a Swedish perspective. And uh, then we have pilot eight, which is AI for CAP. It's uh, the Swedish Board of Agriculture that will test how to work with uh, AI for grassland monitoring. And it's also for, so it's grasslands, it's pastures, it's different kinds of lays and to see are they used or are they not used. And this is for the implementation of the common agricultural policy within the European Union. Pilot nine, which is part of the framework program for Copernicus user uptake, will work with uh, change detection in the coastal zone. And uh, it's uh, based on the needs of uh, those working with coastal planning at municipalities and county boards. We had workshops to uh, find the user needs and the challenges. And then we will work, uh, see how to make uh, an AI application to better understand the uh, changes within the coastal zone, mostly targeting uh, different kinds of peers and uh, other built elements, but it could also in in an extension work with, for example, the plumes of dredging, etc. And uh, this uh, image is from the West Coast and it's taken on uh, the 25th of December. So showing that you could also actually work with, even when you have the sun going up really late, you get some really nice images from the Copernicus program. And uh, <clears throat> Pilot 10 will be marine mapping and AI. And that will be together with SMHI, Havsavattemyndigheten and the uh, Swedish Geological Survey, working with uh, a lot of uh, different physical, chemical and species habitat data together. And, uh, 
having all this data together and uh, used it together with satellite data will hopefully prove to be really powerful. So this is also a pilot to see how could this be done and how could do we get uh, better, more and better information from that. And uh, thank you. This was uh, from the Swedish Space Agency and from the Space Data Lab. Now, Giorgio will uh, continue. I think you are on mute. Yes, sorry. When I start the slideshow, Zoom controls unfortunately go away. Okay. So I yeah. have to get them back. Yeah, that's always the problem. I think that's always with Zoom. Maybe while you're sharing your screen, uh, we can take a question for Tobias. Um, about so the question is let's pretend that in five to ten years we are past the pilot stages and the program is fully implemented how do you envision your products are shared and kept up to date in the swedish many small special interest authorities <laughs> uh yeah i think that we will uh, i mean hopefully we will by showcasing with the pilots that this is important we will have some kind of actual organization where the Space Data Lab and this workbench is uh, localized. It's, we are at the moment having a study to look at which organizations should that be, should it be for, it could be us, the space agency, or it could be some other that are more fit to the task actually. But uh, hope, I think when we have that, we will have this code library, which will be open and available to have this common capacity but if but working with for example this api pilot now with the skog and uh, the agricultural board the forest agency and the board of agriculture and the agency for marine and fresh water i think that uh, we should within the space data lab maintain the apis to the services that the uh, agencies and authorities will use. So I wouldn't say that the, uh, I think, don't think that the responsibility should be on these small agencies. It should be on this central digital building block. Yeah, thank you. And we'll have time for more questions also after uh, Jogi's presentation. So please introduce yourself and uh, start your presentation, presentation, Jogi. Yes, you hear me, uh, right? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Okay, thank you. So I am Jerzy Kovac, a postdoctoral researcher at the machine learning group of uh, Lillao University of Technology. And I have been in the Swedish Space Data Lab project from its beginning. And here today I will talk about the artificial intelligence applications and how at the Swedish Space Data Lab and how we try to introduce artificial intelligence and machine learning to space data in the Swedish Space Data Lab project. This is of course not only our work at Lilleo University of Technology, but in many ways we cooperate with researchers from RISE as well. So part of this will be their work, of course. So to give an overview, uh, we facilitate um, the AI uh, in the Swedish Space Data Lab in two ways. One is to facilitate the AI development of others by creating tasks for them and then supporting the teams that work in these tasks. This is mainly done in hackathons. And we also develop AI solutions ourselves. I will talk about just a few of them. One is unsupervised water detection and others are more work in progress with outlier detection and change detection in coastal zones as Tobias has already mentioned. So to facilitate AI development, we have organized two hackathons so far. One was the Space Data Hackathon in 2020 February and another was the Copernicus Hackathon Sweden, which was 2020 September. 
and in both cases we support we provided support in terms of the task description mentoring if it was required uh, providing the satellite data and the computational platform where th that the teams could use and we were involved in the jury and the, the decision process the difference was that in the first case we provided labeled validation and test data and in the second case we defined the task more freely which had many benefits as you will see later so in this first hackathon we had a simple twofold task. First, a simple time series prediction where the input was a series of, of dates with an av average of uh, some index value. This, in this case, was the NDVI. Uh, and the expected output was that people had to get, um, predict the missing value from the series. And we did so in a tempor spatiotemporal prediction as well where the input was complete images with one area missing in an image. And the expected output was the prediction of the NDVI values for all pixels in the masked area. And the takeaway here was that uh, the was the unreasonable effectiveness of permanence models and very simple models. Unfortunately, we have set the task very strictly. We tried to limit the complexity of the task, which meant that the winners were, were the very simple models. For, for example, the permanence model where ju we just found the closest valid data to the missing data and copied it there. That was very simple. So for the next ha hackathon, we have designed two tasks. That was the snow cloud detection, which we believe to be important for climate change monitoring to differentiate between cloud and cloud cover and snow based on Sentinel-2 data, because this is something that is often mistaken in the available classification layer. And so to understand the effect of climate change and to see, to monitor the snow cover of the globe, it is important that we can dis distinguish between snow and cloud. And another was task was the classification of small areas, which was related to a COVID-19 challenge and pilot that we were planning to work on. And the takeaway here was that since we have given them, the participants, a less defined task with more freedom, they did not focus so much on to perform certain accuracy and F scores so they could come up with more advanced solutions. So we had ResNet and UNET solutions for snow, snow and cloud detection, which we were quite happy with. And to move on to what we have created in terms of AI, is this is mostly the work of a PhD student who works with us. It is unsupervised water detection, where the background is that Water scarcity is, of course, a serious issue. And one important step uh, in fighting against this problem is to monitor the surface water, as has been mentioned by other presenters today. And so we need to distinguish between water and other surface covers. So the task here was to detect the water on Earth's observation images with the assumptions that we only have RGB data uh, we don't have a large, large amount of label data, and we work on classifying tiles, not pixels. So the data was from various sources, including Sentinel-2 data sets in Eurosat and Paxat, where Paxat is uh, a newly created data set for our purposes, and the Sat6 uh, UAV image data set. At the model as an iterative one where the step Z, where we were heavily building on transfer learning. So the question was how well we can use convolutional networks that had been trained on other image data and just use the feature extraction capabilities of those networks without having any labels to just first 
um, second, no, um, divide the results into two groups, which we assumed would be water and non-water, and it was indeed true, and select the cluster centri centroids, and based on that, fine tune the networks and do this in an iterative manner so that the network would get better and better. And the results showed that indeed it was very helpful based on uh, compared to the simple ImageNet network that was in, in initialized on the ImageNet data set, we achieved a high increase in the performance of in terms of F1 score. And what we've concluded was that we got reasonable results given the limitations we set for ourselves. There was a great potential in transfer learning when, especially when looks into what happens when fine tuning happened on Paxat and then testing without any additional training or fine tuning was done on Eurosat and have some future work ideas there as well. But we also have some other works in progress. One is outlier detection, where we take our input from the pilot that was mentioned by Tobias before in Malardelan. And we also work on the change detection in coastal zones, which is another pilot that Tobias mentioned. So for outlier detection, getting the information from the aforementioned pilot, one can have uh, uniform length vectors representing areas. And the goal now is to detect areas that are outliers. First, the first approach here is a simple machine learning approach that is the DBs and clustering. So this is what we are applying at the moment. And as for the change detection in coastal zones, we have divided this task into three different questions and now started our work on the coastline detection for which we also have a master's student who's helping us. And here we are exploring various methods, including the combination of indices and maximum likelihood classification, as well as the unit architecture. And hopefully, we will be able to use these results in the change detection in coastlines and permanent detection, where in both cases our focus is on sequences, but this is at the moment entirely future work. So this has been what I can say about the artificial intelligence approaches that we are using at the moment in the Swedish Space Data Lab. And thank you. Thank you so much. And we have time for questions regarding uh, the Swedish uh, initiative. And maybe I should start with a question to you, Tobias. Um, I guess a lot of people here are super inspired after this uh, webinar, <laughs> listening to uh, what's happening in Australia and Africa. Uh, uh, ESTA and everything and we really have a piece of the puzzle here with the Swedish uh, Space Data Lab and how can you get started? How can you start working with this and where are we in the process to really let in uh, users and things like that? Uh, I, I think that we are in the process to letting in users. We have had uh, users within the system as uh, more on a, as I said, on a pilot basis and also as a test basis. Uh, I'm really not, I think we will have to, I think we still need to work with that they uh, contact us, either they contact AI or they contact me or they contact, uh, take the contact with RISE or LTU to be able to have this uh, come in and test it and get access to the Jupyter notebooks and so on. <clears throat> and uh, otherwise it's also, I mean, we have this uh, Vinova funding is uh, ending in uh, August. So we really need to work with how uh, the space data lab should be after that. And I think that everyone that's interesting should, should just contact us and to discuss how should this be in the future. I don't think it's, I, I really welcome to have more cooperation and more partners within the National Space Data Lab. And um, 
I, th I think that's um, more or less the way forward for us to really expand the partnership and to put out a clear way forward. Yeah. Yeah, so feel free to reach out to any of us uh, and we guide you <laughs> and see what we can do uh, together. Uh, so we have a few questions here. So will the space, data, space lab store and openly distribute ARD data, so say Sentinel, Climate, etc., for Sweden? I think that's a question for you, Tobias. Yes. Uh, yeah, that is the, that is the goal at least and then it will be um, i mean we will we have that at the beginning we have have the focus on uh, making it available for analysis and not actually for downloading but when we have um, when we make uh, analysis on it and we get higher level of, of the analysis ready data then uh, I mean, then I think we really need to make it available. Then it will be part of the of the data that are uh, within the Inspire Directive and so on. So I think that some of the data we actually must make available. And the um, goal is to make it available either as services or as actual data download. Um, we have another question about coastline detection. And that is, what is the theoretical best resolution for the detected coastline? Have you looked into what resolution is required by end users for different purposes? At the moment, we use the coastline detection for as input for the next step in coastline changes. So that wouldn't go to end users right now. But from papers, I have seen that um, I have seen sub-pixel resolution for uh, coastline detection because at the moment we're working with Sentinel-2 with 10 meter per pixel, but we have seen, I have seen results with, as I said, sub-pixel resol um, resolution. So I think it was maybe meter resolution, but I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have a question related to what Adam talked about later about completely in the cloud and what that means for us in Sweden and for the space uh, data lab. And I think that's a really interesting question and something we need to discuss. I don't know, Tobias, if you have any thoughts on this. Yes, I think it will be part of, part of uh, this um, analysis that we have ordered to see who should be who should be um, in uh, have the responsibility over the space data lab and also where to work with it? I think in, at the moment it's really beneficial for us to be at uh, the Rice data center. And I mean, for anyone that's not at Rice, it will be in the cloud, of course. So I mean, it's uh, like a small but very powerful cloud for this, this and other purposes. And uh, I definitely think that it needs to be be in some kind of cloud environment in that way to not have the data dispersed to all users to really have the data and the compute in the same place. I think that's really important. Yeah. And I also guess that in the development of the space data lab, there can be different, different tracks and different solutions. Uh, so we have this first solution and then Maybe that would change. I don't know, but, but I yes, think... yes, and and it might be. I mean, if if this when we go into a more of a production phase, then maybe then I I, I guess that we will continue to work ex experimental and have some kind of experimental environment. But the production environment, I I I wouldn't say that it shouldn't be on the same data center, but it don't have to be on the same data center. But I think that having this experimental data lab in an experimental data center, I think that's a good good thing. But for the production, it might be that it should be on another, at another place actually, or another facility. Yeah. Okay. I can't see any more questions here. Um, so I think maybe we should wrap up uh, and have a bit early lunch. I think that's uh, fine for everyone. Um, but just also want to thank everyone for listening into this and 
since the interest is so huge, I think we will definitely do more webinars in the future in relation to the Space Data Lab and try to invite inspiring speakers, but also give an update on the Swedish Space Data Lab and what is happening, because I think that's very valuable for many, uh, many of you uh, to be able to listen in. And, and of course, also come with your needs and your ideas and everything, because that, that is also <laughs> important to see how we can develop this further and, and things like that. So I definitely think we will continue and, uh, and try to uh, find more interesting speakers. I'm really inspired by uh, listening to everyone today. Um, so I think, yeah, and it feels exciting that we are building this in Sweden as well and, and really needed. Uh, and we can learn a lot from, from others as well. I don't know, Tobias, do you have any closing words from your side? No, I think I would just want to uh, add to that actually, and that it's one of the things that we will work work with during the spring is to actually see how to continue and how to get this cooperation expanded. Yeah. Okay, then I think we end for today. And, uh, oh, most interesting webinar this year. I think that is... Uh, <laughs> It's the, still the beginning of the year, but I still <laughs> feel that this is a good, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Okay, so bye everyone and see you next time probably. Yes, <laughs> bye. Bye, thank you all for uh, joining. Yes, thank you so much.